Welcome everybody. Uh, this is our second day in this introduction to model for uh, programming and parallel computing. So just in the first uh, yesterday we just go and rush on uh, over the basics of the language in a couple of hours. So I understand that it's uh, uh, it's not enough for, for learning just the programming language. Hours. Um, but at least it gives you the, the elements that, that will help you to follow the material that we will present um, today uh, and the next couple of days. So today we will be talking about um, parallel programming, uh, which is central to high performance computing. So first we will do a uh, discussion of, about what it is and why we use parallel programming today. Um, and, uh, and in the second hour, we will introduce the first paradigm uh, of parallel computing using Fortran as the main language for it. It is called OpenMP. So let's start with why parallel computing. Yeah. Back in the 90s, it was clear that the future at some point um, will require to move out from increasing the speed of processors uh, into using more, into going into some sort of parallel uh, scheme for computation. Yeah, it's true that at that time exist uh, vector machines, which are the, the old way of doing some kind of parallelism, uh, basically with vectors and arrays and, and those machines were capable of, of processing those, those elements in parallel. They were built for that. Uh, but we are talking about a trend that follows at the end of the 90s uh, in, in the first years of the, uh, of the 21st century, where it became clear that uh, single CPU, single core computers will no longer exist uh, and will be about. That it was actually true. And if you see from this curve uh, that came from this Princeton Liberty Research Group, um, it was clear back in 2004 that uh, even if the number of transistors is still follow the trend of uh, what is called the Moore's law that duplicate basically every, almost every uh, two years. It was no longer the case that C, sequential serial codes will get the benefit of um, uh, faster and faster processors. So it was this knee here. So if the trend that was through back during the 90s, it will follow straight line, uh, the codes today, the serial codes today, uh, should be 12 times faster. And that's not the case. It means that the serial codes that we have today, uh, they run as it was expected, uh, like the computers of eight years uh, ago. If the train will follow, will, 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 will have continue uh, up, to, up to these days. So there is something happened, something happened there. That, that something that happens was right here on the bottom is that, mm, okay, one more. That mm, machines, instead of having faster and faster cores, they start having just more. So serial code could not catch up with this trend. Simply couldn't. Uh, the solution was parallelism. The solution was moving away from writing sequential code into writing parallel code. Thanks to those uh, uh, multiple codes that were included on a single machine. And that is still the case in 2021. Um, 
it will it, it has not changed. It will not change because what it constrains the ability to make faster and faster processor is thermodynamics. It's physics. You cannot you cannot easily uh, overcome those things. Um, so there is another way of looking into these ideas about parallelism and why we need to go to that. And it, it, it's from this figure first. The transistor count has been duplicated effectively. So you see this figure here back into the, this. This is discovering even uh, backwards. So those are the very first Intel processors from this from the seventies, um, and since that time they, they have like five thousand, ten thousand uh, transistors inside, and today we have billions, uh, even trillions of all, of, of those transistors um, in the uh, in the modern machines. So you have here a few, let's say AMD, Intel. Uh, and even they have a, a comparison with uh, some GPUs. So the, the number of transistors grow, um, but it's still uh, what dominates now is having multiple cores. So the, those machines have those transistors because they have 61, 12, 15, or 72, a, a number of cores. And you can only take advantage of those extra cores if you are actually running parallel programming if you are, are if the code is able to do concurrent stuff somehow um, there is another way of looking into this and then, then from another perspective uh, and it's right in this thing and this is uh, this is actually quite interesting um, so here let's see number of transistors they've been growing and the line is okay. There is a trend. It's a log scale. This is the uh, the years. So they are growing, uh, uh, following the trend. However, the performance this the performance has been uh, saturated uh, at some point in the single thread performance. This is a mean, I mean the serial the performance that you can achieve running a serial code. Uh, in general, it will look like this. So this is basically the same figure here. So it is the same track. Uh, there is something that is preventing new the uh, new processor from achieving the same performance that we were expecting, uh, the same increase in performance that we were expecting back in the 90s. That's no longer the case. Uh, also, this saturation here is, is Basically related to this other curve, the green, the green dots, is the frequency of the process. The frequency of processors today have not changed in almost 10 years or, or even 20 years. Uh, you see a few processors here, those are two gigahertz, and still the processors that we have today are 2.3, 2.6 gigahertz. That has not changed. Uh, it's basically stayed in this, in this area. Uh, and you will not expect to have an, uh, a processor that runs at 4 gigahertz uh, for a long period of time. So they, they include now something that is called turbo boost or something like that. They decrease the, the, the speed up of the processor. That is usually done by disabling some other, other cores in the machine just to prevent uh, overheating. So you get that, you, you extend, you improve the single thread execution or simple or serial uh, execution by penalizing that, by reducing the number of cores that are, are actually active at, the, at some point. Uh, and not for a long period of time. So this is something that uh, the, the CPU will control with some sensors, temperature, and if the temperature rises to a certain point, it, it will simply scale out. And that's what you have. This trend again, this blue and green trends are also uh, related to the power consumption. And power consumption is translated in heat dissipation. So all those transistors 
really, really achieve uh, high temperatures, and you need more sophisticated ways to take all that heat out of that system. Either, either you put in bigger grids uh, to move that still with, um, with air, or you use sophisticated ways of heat dissipation, like liquid, uh, liquid systems, or using more sophisticated uh, uh, liquids uh, to move the heat out of those processes. But it's still, we are getting an increase. Those are the, the black dots here in the number of cores that we include on those machines. So it, today it is really uh, commonly found in machines, desktop and even laptop machines with eight cores, four eight cores. Uh, it's, not, it's not so unusual. And that trend will probably continue. So it, 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 at some point in the next five or ten years, you will see um, a, um, process, processors with uh, 12, 40, or 100 cores. Will it will it will be true? Another thing is a movement that is more recent between uh, moving those heavy processors like the, the Intel into a more simplified version of processor like, like ARM uh, that consume less amount of energy and they offer better performance per watt. So this is a trend that, uh, that uh, some companies have followed. Apple had, had plans to change entirely their processors to something that is ARM-based. Um, and there are also systems that use this, this technology. Um, so the, the, the final the message here is that parallel is a reality, has been a reality for, for more than 20 years. And if you really, really want to squish all the performance for scientific purposes, uh, you need to rely on, on parallelism somehow. And, and that was uh, uh, something that people back in the 90s realized. Uh, and they start working on solutions for that, in inserting parallelism in the language itself. So uh, back in the 90s, it was creating something called a high performance Fortran. It was not part of the language. It was like an extension of Fortran 90 uh, that provides some constructs for, for supporting parallel computing. Uh, from that era, something survived. Some of that survived. Uh, and one of those things that survived was included relatively recent on, on, on Fortran, on, on the Fortran standard itself. And those are called co arrays. And I will show you an example of how that works uh, the Fortran core. So this is part of the language. Um, the, for example, we will demonstrate this with the Fortran uh, for the Intel compiler. So you can run it in the Intel compiler. You can use the GCC compiler, but you need an external library and attach and compile in a very special way uh, the compiler. So be able to support that both for uh, parallelizing this with multi-threading, um, and we will explain that, or for using MPI on top of that. And, and uh, parallelizing on multiple machines. So this is the um, the way this works. The core rate is you know, it, it's by declaring some elements. For example, here you will see here some of those. This integer, this integer has this square bracket here. Uh, this is square bracket here, and those things. Right? So the, uh, we have a few variables here that have a square bracket with a star inside. It means that this code is meant to use core arrays. What it means is that when you execute this, this code, multiple copies of, the, of, of this process will run. All those copies will have one number that differentiate them. And that number, is, you can access that number through this function. It will become an intrinsic function for the, for the execution. It, it means a number for this image, for 
this particular instance of the call of, of the execution. And we can uh, you can also access the runtime the number of images that you are using. Um, so using this variable, you can redirect the execution into different directions. This particular example here, I mean using this core array idea uh, for running on multiple cores for computing uh, uh, pi with an integral quadrature. Uh, that is what's happening here. So different images are selecting different portions of the summation. So you have the curve and you are dividing that in rectangles um, and different cores. So different process, uh, processes are taking a bunch of those, of those rectangles for computing the, the height and make the summation. Uh, so they are doing that here. And at the end, I am collecting all the contributions of the sum here. Um, so actually, uh, here, here they are collecting the, the contributions. Uh, and that aggregate uh, will be the value of pi. So here is the computation done on each on each image. So this is part of the language. It's, it's been the standard. Uh, it's from 2018, and you can compile this, for example, with the intercompile. Uh, I made a mistake. There is a typo here. I will fix it. Uh, the, forget about this dollar sign. Is I for dash core array to enable to the, the core array execution. Um, and this is the example. Uh, and the example is also in the, in the folder that, that I showed you yesterday for, um, for with all of the examples for, for Fortran, OpenMP, it's, it's there. So when you execute this, you will see that we, I, I ran this on a machine uh, where I execute with 48 images and I compute pi and I got uh, uh, the error from that computation, right? Uh, so that is one way of introducing parallel computing inside the language itself. Um, that was, this is just one case, but in general, the solution that has been adopted um, is going more general than this not attach the parallelization to a specific language, but creating a schema or something that is more attached to the compiler. So the compiler will be aware of parallelization instead of the language. The language will be agnostic, will, be, will not be aware of, of any specific parallelization scheme. Um, and that will, uh, that, that is the solution offered for uh, the three, four um, paradigms that, that we will demonstrate these days. So one of the, OpenMP is one of those. So in OpenMP, this is not part of the language. So, uh, but a compiler could support OpenMP. And if you put some comments here, some specific comments, those are comments for the language. Notice that they start with uh, exclamation mark. So yesterday we learned that everything that starts with exclamation mark is a comment. So from the point of view of Fortran, this is completely ignored. Fortran will not, the Fortran standard will not say anything about this, will not know about this. A compiler, if the compiler is aware of those, of, of, of those pragmas or those directives in the, in the case of or for those directives, it will do something about the, for example, the loop that is inside. It will provide some parallelization, but it will be the compiler who will do that, and that's the solution in the case of, of for OpenMP. This is basically the same code uh, that we have here, or well, at least the same idea, uh, computation here um, with OpenMP for compiling this is like this. We will see, we'll, we'll try to show you all in a bit, uh, how that works in practice so with examples. And this is how you compile a code that uses OpenMP uh, with G4 
If you want to use the Intel compiler, this is how you do it. Now, the, the, the argument here is slightly different. And if you want to use the NVIDIA Fortran compiler, this is how you do it. It's dash MP. And I use this, uh, the one nice thing that has the NVIDIA Fortran compiler is that they have this flag here or this, this extra argument here that will show you when you compile, will show you all the regions that it paralyzes and how it paralyzes and why, which are the, the selections or choices done uh, during compilation for paralyzing a certain code, either using OpenMP, OpenECC, or, or even internal pipelining. It will, it will tell you all about that. Uh, which is nice. So uh, it's very informative to use this, this compiler, uh, thanks to that. Um, so those are the three ways for compiling a code that uses OpenMP. And OpenMP are all those directives. And we will see that uh, in the second hour, uh, we will have that. Um, so that's one way of parallelizing. Another alternative is called OpenACC. OpenACC appear, um, appears after OpenMP, so it's a newer solution. Um, and it has a brighter, a, a wider scope. So uh, originally, OpenMP was dealing only with a machine that has uh, a certain amount of memory, eventually NUMA, non-uniform memory action. Now we talked about that uh, yesterday, uh, I think. Uh, but anyway, we have some memory and different sockets eventually will have different accesses to different for, for different portions of the memory. So we have, for example, those slots here are closer to this socket and this socket has uh, this number of cores and this so another socket, so another, pro another CPU uh, has this other number of cores. All those cores are able to access all the memory here, but they are not able to access at the same speed, at the same, uh, at the same timing. So that's why it's called OpenMP was created to deal with this kind of situation. But uh, back in, let's say 2010, around, around it started emerging, uh, popularizing uh, alternatives to this idea of having just, just a machine with multiple cores of it. It was the, uh, the era of uh, accelerators. GPUs today are one of the most prominent accelerators. In the past, we had the Xeon 5 that uh, Intel, uh, Intel abandoned as a technology. Uh, but some of the ideas that uh, were created for the Intel and uh, Xeon, the Intel uh, Xeon 5, were integrated in the ABS 512. So some of that was rescue on, on, on those systems. But we are talking about a situation like this. This is a very typical configuration for one of our um, GPU machines. So that's why I, I created it this way. So we have two sockets here, so two CPUs. Each CPU, we have 12 cores here, 12 cores here. So we have on the box, inside the box, we have 24 uh, actual cores, real cores. Uh, and we have a memory of, of around 96 gigabytes of RAM. And this is the entire machine. This is, this is the machine. Attached to that machine, we have three, usually three GPUs, uh, RTX 6000 or P6000. And that's what we have in most of them. Um, so all those GPUs, they have their own memory. Those are called accelerators. They have their own memory. So when you need to process data with them, you need to move memory from here, from the, from the RAM into this memory. That is a high, band, high bandwidth memory in order to process data inside the GPU. So the idea is different. And that's why something else was, was, was created. And that something else is OpenACC. OpenACC was capable of, from the beginning, from the design, 
to do the extra data movement that is required for, for this kind of process, this kind of idea. The external devices that are able to crunch data very efficiently for certain purposes, uh, but they have a separate memory. They have a this distinct uh, memory and you have to move data from here to there and the, and the data back. Uh, so that is OpenACC. The idea, it was similar to OpenMP and many things are really, really similar. And the idea now is to merge somehow asymptotically OpenACC and OpenMP. So OpenMP now in version 4.5, I think, they are now supporting accelerators and some of the ideas start merging. So the, the distance, the gap between those two technologies are, are, is, are getting, is getting close. Um, closer. Uh, so same idea, same code um, that converts pi with, with a quadrature for, uh, for a function here. And here we have the directives. We have this directive here and this directive here. And we will talk about these directives tomorrow in our session about uh, OpenACC. Um, that will parallelize this execution. Eventually, could be uh, on a multi-core machine, so using the, the cores of the machine, uh, the, this, this course, all those 24 cores, or parallelizing on a separate machine, on a separate uh, device, on a, on a GPU. Uh, that is this, that is the draw of this. So this is saying this section here, can be parallelized, and I want it to be parallelized somehow. During compilation time, it will be decided how that will be parallelized. So the idea is different in that sense. Um, how you compile that? Uh, well, the Intel compiler doesn't support is, uh, uh, OpenACC, and there are reasons for that. More, more mostly commercial reasons because NVIDIA is the main uh, uh, supporter of OpenACC and, and that they, they are, let's say, in, in competition on, on about are related to this. So they will not support this directly, but uh, both GCC, G4Tran, in, in our case, so we are talking about Fortran here, um, support OpenACC and uh, NVIDIA Fortran, of course, have, you have the best support for OpenACC. So when tomorrow when we discuss uh, OpenACC in detail, we will prefer to use this one. Uh, it's cleaner, uh, you have this information about the execution, about all that, uh, uh, and the data movement, and we, we are able to do some things uh, that are only available or with the uh, NVIDIA Forger compiler. Okay, now, uh, the final element here is, is a completely different parallel. And this is the, let's say, the, the elite of, of parallel execution here is MPI. We will discuss about MPI uh, on Thursday. And that is a completely different thing. So I'm basically moving to for, for, for Thursday. The idea is that in that case, you have a library uh, that parallelizes execution, uh, but that execution is taking place on multiple machines eventually. It could be one single machine, but it could be multiple machines. So it's, it's a completely different thing. And it's much harder because here with OpenMP and, uh, and OpenACC, the idea is to take a serial code and insert without, with minimal changes to the original sources, a few instructions for parallelizing this. With MPI, we are really reconsidering, rethinking, rewriting uh, basically the entire code for parallelization. So uh, some codes really go into this and to parallelizing with MPI. Uh, the top of the, the, the top of this, the, the lead of the lead of this um, in parallel programming is using both alternatives, all alternatives possible actually, MPI 
with OpenMP, with OpenACC, and eventually some CUDA things for really programming in, uh, in uh, uh, taking all alternatives to maximize performance um, for execution. So today we will talk about OpenMP, uh, and we have we will have good time for that. Uh, tomorrow we will discuss OpenACC, and Thursday we will discuss MPI exclusively. Uh, and tomorrow, I think we will discuss also an alternative. Well, OpenACC is highly attached to our running on, on, on accelerators, and one of those accelerators are GPUs. So an alternative to, uh, to OpenACC sorry, uh, is directly programming in something called Fortran QD. It is an extension of the language, and you have to use a special compiler. And uh, this goes directly talking to the hardware. Uh, for the fluorization. So that is well, the most extreme case. We will just show an example of, of how that works. Uh, and so that's why we will move those two things. So um, MPI and, and Fortran Q, that will be extreme cases uh, of parallelization that we will discuss in Fortran for Fortran uh, tomorrow and uh, Thursday. So now let's go. Um, for the topic and the next section. So we will have that for going slowly. OpenMP. So with OpenMP is a directive based approach. So it means that you put things like this. There are comments from the point of view of the compiler or the, of the language. So the language reads this as comments, they will ignore this. You know, if you are just using directives, you can still compile this program, the code like this, with a normal compiler that doesn't know anything about OpenMP and the code is still runs, works, compiles, it's okay. You can go further and, and we will actually use this because it's really convenient for debugging and for the understanding of the of what is going on here. Uh, we will, you can also use the API. So in the case of Fortran, it's loading a module, a special module that it will give you access, for example, to know which is the, uh, the, the ID for the thread, the number of threads. Also having a more uh, insight uh, about the internals of the execution. Uh, at that moment, the code will no longer compile if the compiler is not, uh, doesn't support OpenMP in this case. So OpenMP has been around for quite some time. Uh, the first uh, specification uh, are from the late 90s. Um, and uh, today I think most compilers uh, support, I think all compilers, relevant compilers support OpenMP 3 for quite some time. Uh, and the kind of compilers that we will be using um, today, they support, I think, entirely uh, OpenMP uh, 4.0. Uh, and uh, and uh, much of OpenMP 4.5. Uh, and the, the reality is that we will not be using the uh, the the complexities or, or nice things from, from OpenMP 4 or 4.5. What they do they have been uh, improving around groups, so you can uh, group threadings and um, um, enlarge and train those things. So this thread grouping is something that it, uh, I will consider too advanced for this introductory lesson. And so the main message here is everything that we will do should be you should be able to compile on any compiler today so in, in, that you in, in practice you want to use uh, now how this looks like in fortran there is similar versions for this for the three main languages in scientific computing the three main languages for scientific computing are fortran c and c plus plus period uh, all those three had native support uh, or, or the, the specification had uh, special support for, for them. 
and they look very similar. What they change, what change between those three uh, programming languages is the way you declare this brackmas or comments or directives. Uh, so this is something as specific for for Fortran because this looks like a Fortran comment. In, in C, the, the comments are different, but after this, the words here are exactly the same uh, for most of them. And also there are a few changes on what, and we will talk about that, which is decided to be private or public in the variables, uh, in some loops. Uh, there, there is a difference between C and Fortran, so, but we are focusing on Fortran. So this is a small program here for Fortran. Um, uh, and you can compile this, and it depends on how many threads. So that you compile this this way. So this is how you compile it. Um, and you can decide at runtime uh, how many threads do you. By default, it will select as many threads here uh, as C uh, scores the uh, the system. So. so uh, if you are running, for example, on, on, on Thorny, and on the head node, we have 24 cores, actually, um, but we have enabled on the head node um, hyper thread. So the machine will look like having uh, 48 cores. So by default, if you execute on, on the head node, uh, you will see 48. Uh, uh, lines, 48 lines like this. Uh, so we will see that. So let's go and and see before I uh, uh, I discuss the details on, on this. So let's go here. Uh, I'm sharing this or not? I'm sharing this, uh, Daniel. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So the, the, no, it's because sometimes I'm sharing just the browser, uh, but I think that I'm sharing. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sharing the entire screen. I think so. Oh, anyway. Uh, okay. So. Oh, by the way, this is for the fourth one. Uh, Updates. Okay. Um, so let's go and do this. Right. Oh, okay. This one. This was the example that I told you. Yeah. Uh, a few minutes ago about a core race. So you can compile this and execute it. Uh, this one, for example, this one was the, uh, the code that I showed you uh, a few minutes ago about uh, OpenMP. So before we enter on OpenMP and you understand all those things, uh, uh, let, let's compile this, let's compile this. So, which are my models right now? Uh, nothing. So, those um, line C in the one. This is okay. G Fortran minus F OpenMP. This is how you compile code with OpenMP, and I will compile this one. Okay. That is that it returns really quickly. I was computing uh, and with the maximum integer there. So uh, the, this is the max integer, not is the code. Uh, example CO2. So, so I was using uh, huge, oh well, the, the maximum divided by one, by, by one, but that, that's that thing. Uh, 
but let's do it. Uh, let's select us a little bit more. So it takes some time for execution. And so I will recompile. I uh, will execute. I will put some time in here. So um, so it took one point uh, uh, 1.7 uh, seconds for computing this. You can change. Uh, The number of threads here. Oh, oh. Without export. I would not export this. Um, so using just two threads. So two cores will be working on this. And it will take a while. And you can imagine if I put just one, one thread of this. So if I execute serially, it could take uh, around twice this. So, ah, and I forgot to put the time. Well, so it takes like 20 seconds, something like that. Um, And I was running with extra precision, so just to force some extra calculation. So here, like here, I was using, uh, I think, 48, uh, uh, oh, 48 threads, because it was assuming that we have 40 ports. Uh, so 22 seconds, 22 seconds, uh, almost 23. All of sides for for doing the same thing. So with a couple of threads. So two cores were were working on this, um, and you know how many cores we have here. So we have. It's assuming that we have forty eight cores. The reality is that we are doing hyper threading. So we have two threads per core, and so the actual number of cores per socket is 12. So the actual number uh, uh, of cores, physical cores on this machine is 24, not 40. Uh, so that, that's it. That, that is the first thing that I did. And I think then uh, the other code was, this one is for open ACC. So we will discuss about this tomorrow. Um, so now, I uh, put it down. I will fix this. Um, so here, let's review uh, one simple case. Well, yeah, but it's one of the exercises. Uh, it right here. Exercise. I think, yes. So this one. This is a more elaborated or a little bit more elaborated version of, of what I wrote here. Uh, it's basically a, a Printing something, and we will see that. But I'm using the API. So I will see the ID and I will see the number of threads there. So let's compile this. Let's compile this. D4 minus F of any B. Uh, I think I actually export uh, the number of threads. That's why I'm getting just two. So you get this, you get OpenMP, thread number zero of two, OpenMP number, thread number one out of two. Uh, and, the, uh, and, and some time that I put there, but that is red. 
So on set, I will unset the variable. That's how you do it. Open in G now. Threads. So you can check that the, the variable is no longer defined there. Nothing. And if I you execute this, you get all those things. And you had 48. And uh, this one is the last one. And by the way, there is no ordering on this. We will see about the ordering uh, later on. Uh, but you said when you print all those threads and independent executions, uh, and they will print somehow uh, in not particular order. Uh, and by default, it will select as many core, as many threads as logical cores. So even if you are doing, when you are, if you are doing hyper threading, it will take all those uh, threads, even if they don't have, they don't have any physical code for it. And so this is the most simple execution. So you attach sections. And in the case of Fortran, you have to open and close, and, and, the, and the final close is end something. So you, you open parallel here, this section, this section from here to here will be parallelized. As many threads as you run of this, uh, everything inside will be executed by one of those threads uh, concurrently. And this is how you uh, control the number of threads that you actually want for your execution. Um, what else? Before we move into more uh, OpenMP, uh, it's, it's a good idea to understand what was the alternative before. Uh, there is not, there, there is one thing uh, called pthreads, but it's only for C. There is one version that IBM create for the IX uh, Fortran compiler, uh, which is something that we don't have. Uh, so I cannot demonstrate the way that pthreads work uh, in Fortran. Uh, so I'm making this example. I don't have any alternative, just instead of using C here. Uh, but I will try to explain you a little bit how this uh, works. So here you are loading. This is like loading a module. Um, in C, this is a header um, that will enable all the capabilities of Pthreads. Pthreads is a library that is able to deal with the creation and management of multiple threads uh, that are fork uh, in front of, from a single execution. So uh, the code will fork the execution and this will create the threads uh, and, um, uh, and control the execution. Uh, it's slightly easy, it's easier than the alternative. The alternative is going directly into the into the system calls for, for forking actually our, our process. Um, so this is one step up, uh, uh, on top of that. Um, and it's called P threads. And with this, for example, if we want to execute multiple threads, what, what you are doing is creating a, here uh, an array with the number of threads that you want. And here you will uh, creating with a pointer, a certain number of threads, and for each one of those, you will run the function here, hello electron here, that is here. So when you execute this, uh, you you will get the, the, uh, as many messages as threads you ask. And here I am asking for four. So I don't know if they can uh, let's see compile this. Uh, put it here. Um, So you compile this with mm, this, and after we complain, LP thread. Oh. Oh, like this. This is how you compile it, and it will run. And you see the message four times. So four, 
um, different threads will execute this and will print the message uh, on their own. Uh, and this, that's it. Uh, so this is too complicated for such simple thing as creating just threads for execution. So it will be impractical from, from the scientific point of view you, if you have to do, the, do it this way. Uh, this one in, is the alternative, something so simple as creating uh, a few comments. You don't have to rewrite the entire code. You take a serial code and you convert it into a parallel code directly. Um, so uh, now, in a small note about this, the difference between a process and, and a thread. Uh, a process is a much bigger uh, object in a, a, a computer. So a process has its own memory, it controls execution, it, it, it has a, a bunch of capabilities. A thread is a, is, is a handicapped version of that. Um, so it's lighter, uh, it's easier to span, but it doesn't have all the capabilities. Uh, in particular, all the threads that execute associated to the same process, they are able to see the same memory that all of them uh, are sharing the memory. And that's why this kind of solution, multi-threading, is, is, the, is the right solution for the machine, that the machines that we have today, that are all multi-processors. They all have mm, four, eight, or, or 20 processors, um, uh, cores, and those see the same memory. So even your cell phone has four, eight cores and they see all the same memory. So, uh, but the way we think about those things is very different from the way of someone writing multi-threading uh, codes, for example, for a cell phone or for uh, uh, a desktop application or, or, or things like that. Uh, usually, for example, when you have a browser, uh, the browser could have either multi-process or um, a process attached to each tab on, on a browser uh, and each, each tab will be independent uh, or they have threads for each tab. So, uh, and not all threads are working that they are doing something serious or something demanding at the same time. For us, for scientists, um, we are putting a lot of of work in those threads. So the way we see all those things is different. So OpenMP is a, a, a tool for more for scientific computing for putting threads that are in heavy load. Yeah. Different from the kind of multi-threading that someone will do, for example, for databases or for answering a server a daemon or something like that. Uh, it's a different. It is a different solution for five different problems. Uh, so, um, one of the things that we will face when we are do running multi-thread in execution is being attentive to data dependencies and data races. Yeah, those two concepts. Uh, again, all those process, all those threads are able to see the same memory. So uh, if you are not careful in how you program those things, you can be writing or reading from one variable and know that those other threads will write on the same variable. And one of the, all those threads will erase that change by writing back another, another thing on the same location in memory. Several, all those threads had the capability in principle to write, read and write and overwrite on the same location of memory. Uh, and some process, some, some algorithms uh, contain dependencies that prevent uh, the execution to be parallelized. Uh, and that's something inherent to the, to the algorithm. You cannot do much about that. You can solve, solve some of those problems with some techniques and people have developed those techniques for more than 20 years to basically contour data dependencies um, with some alternatives. And another thing that happens with, with those is that if you are executing uh, um, 
multiple threads, some of them could reach the final point faster than others. And if you are not careful, they could start working on something that, it, that depends on some other threads having finishing and writing the, the, the data on the right place. So putting in competition the, the, those, those threads is something that we need to be aware of. Uh, and the solutions for that are separating variables, and we will see how we separate variables, how you make private copies of certain variables. Another solution for, especially for data races, is to have light barriers, so synchronization barriers, uh, elements that will make like a stack, uh, 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 a wall uh, that only is, uh, is raised when all the threads reach a certain location. So all those things are uh, things that are really, really new in programming. If you are familiar uh, up, to, up to now with just serial programming, you never faced those things before. Uh, so that's why it's important to go slowly and understand because the, those, those are not so uh, intuitive at the very beginning, uh, how those things work. But the, this is something inevitable. The parallel programming is not easy. That's why this is kind of an advanced, uh, an advanced workshop. Uh, even if the topics are uh, kind of introductory for themselves, for those things. So the OpenMP is much more than they will be showing you today, but, but at least you will have an, a fair experience on what is this and how you program those things in Fortran. Uh, so uh, one example of a data dependency, this thing. This is a typical case of a data dependency here. Oh, well, this, this is not, the, 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 sorry, this has not data dependency. We have something that initialized with zero, we, we initialize the first element, but we are computing A uh, with I, the, uh, the I element of A, using elements from a different array. Uh, and we are using the element I minus one from a completely different array. So that is something that poses no problem. You can parallelize that. There, there are not data dependencies here. Uh, but that is completely different if you have something like this. You have here the first element, and to compute the next element, you need information from the previous element. So you cannot split this, let's say, in two halves and from one to um, 5,000, 50,000, and from 50,000 to 100,000. Because for computing the, the, the element 50,000, you need the 449,999. Uh, so you cannot do it. You simply cannot do it. You cannot provide something like this. Um, now imagine, for example, another case is when you are running, uh, let's say, a molecular dynamics. You cannot parallelize time. You cannot let this processor to compute the first 10 seconds or 10 nanoseconds of simulation and then another processor to, to, to work with the next 10 nanoseconds. Uh, because for reaching the, the first part of the second half, you need all the information, all the simulation from the previous, previous part. So you cannot parallelize time. Uh, so those things are intrinsic. You cannot solve those things. So not everything can be parallelized. And there are things that can be parallelized. For example, if you have something that works on some space and you are simulating that, you can make what is called a domain decomposition. You have half of the space and you one processor could simulate one iteration of half of the space. Another processor will have, will work with another half of the space, and they will share some information in the border and in, in, in the, in the frontier of those. They will have, we need some communication somehow, but that is okay, that is okay. After they finish with one iteration, so we will have to, need, we will need a bar in place for the next iteration, uh, but that is also okay. So uh, we can parallelize that, that, that kind of things. Um, but not, not everything can be parallelized. So that, that is an important message. Uh, so here, this is an example of something very, very simple. Uh, 
that we can prolapse. And this is the prototypical case of prolization in Fortran, or the easiest way of prolapsing in Fortran, something, uh, are loops, loops like this. Something that is happening for a, a batch of cases. Uh, there are no data dependencies here, so element I is completely independent. We just need something here. That, yeah, it's not it's not affecting this and this is perfectly okay so you can spread this if this is one million you can divide it for a certain number of workers uh, and they will work independently and and e each of them will write on the same array no problem about that so all of them will see the same array and uh, but they are just writing on different locations of that array uh, so this is okay. The, the, this can be prolized. Uh, the way you compile this, I don't know if we, I have here the simple here. Uh, I probably got it. Uh, you compile it this way. Oh, let's probably let's just copy this. I don't know where I wrote it. Imagine, I compile this without making any flag, any argument for OpenMP. So if I execute this, I am running the serial. Uh, I'm not using OpenMP in this. Uh, I'm doing something wrong. Oh, okay, okay, it's because I'm using this, uh, it's putting this on the stack. Uh, let, me see. let me, let me, okay, this is a good, uh, okay, the reason for this, for this, for code is that I am running this, whatever, okay, for a really huge number, one thing. Uh, so I'm using a big number here, so the maximum integer that I can create uh for single precision let's say um and i am creating an array of that size so that array you will we try to be on a stack and i have limits for that i think i mentioned that yesterday right uh a little bit in the hurry but i mentioned that yesterday that we have this uh, limit eight megabytes so it's it's too small for that. I have two choices, or I reduce the size of this array, something that I don't want to do, uh, or uh, okay, or I check which is my hard limit, and my hard limit is unlimited. So I can set uh, limited here. I can do it for this small execution. I know that will finish quickly. Uh, so, but please don't execute things on, on the head node. Um, for something that will take more than one minute. So, and I compile this, and uh, it will take a while. Uh, oh, still doing that? Maybe it's too high. It's too high. Yeah, it's too high. What did you touch? Uh, I will reduce the size of the array. Oh. Oh. Okay. Yeah. And so here, let me see. Oh. But I'm not using OpenMP right now. So I'm not compiling with OpenMP. If I want to compile this, uh, uh, let's see if I get something from the timing here. 
Uh, it's too small. I don't believe this 0 0.00. Um, but then when I would like to use OpenMP, I can find it this way. And yeah, I don't think the time has changed. Uh, the, the numbers are not real. It's too small. Uh, but yes, so I am compiling this. Uh, okay, but okay, let me show you how this compiles with this Fortran compiler, which give me some information. This is nice. Um, module load um, then NVIDIA HPC. Okay. So now I have this MB Fortran. Uh, 2000, uh, 2020, um, and the way you compile this is like this. Fortran, B, and I like to use this M info for all. So I will get uh, some messages here. So, okay. So uh, the code detect that on line number seven, there is an open MP parallel uh, thing. And it right. But what this code is doing is actually different. It's not parallelized, right? As it's written right now. Uh, what? Uh, oh no, yes, this. Yeah, no, sorry. Yeah, yes, this. Uh, it's parallel loop. Oh, yeah, this one, yes. So it's taking this and it's splitting this uh, loop here in sections. And it's, uh, uh, and those sections are computing uh, chunks of, of the array uh, in parallel. So now let's go for a slightly more complex execution here. What happens with this? Same thing here in this code, uh, there is this parallel loop. Notice that it starts here with parallel two and then that's here and parallel two. So uh, this execution, this loop here uh, is divided, it's split in, in, in chunks. They are decided during runtime, not during compile time. So, that. and now what it's doing this is is doing what actually? Uh, so it's computing and uh, some surfaces. Okay, some ratios. There's some ratios between the surface of the sphere uh, and the volume of the cube that is. Uh, just inside that. So uh, the ratio changes. Um, so I have here this execution information about polarization, and I am getting all those bunch of numbers here for different, for different sizes, uh, all the numbers. But what happens here? Some of those uh, values here by default are shared between all the all the threads. So you, some of those values should not be shared. For example, diameter. You don't want another thread to write on the same location for the diameter because okay, for the diameter, it's not cube size. Okay, yeah, yes, exactly. For example, the cube, the diameter. 
The diameter is related to the cube side, and the cube side is related to i. So different threads will have a different value of i. It will compute. It will have a different value of cube size, uh, and it will write on the same location in memory diameter. One will overimpose diameter over the others, and so that's why you are getting one of those right diameter uh, here. Because I think that this one is printed actually. Uh, okay, the area to volume is here. So they are writing that uh, all the same value because one of them right at the end and that value was preserved for all of them. This is wrong. This is the, this is the wrong procedure. And the reason for this being wrong is that some of those variables here should be private, should be separated for every single thread. You really don't want to mess those, to, to, to overwrite those values. Uh, there are on the other side some of those which are okay if they are shared. For example, this one. This one is okay. Area to wall. The ratio, we are using an array here. So um, let me see here. We are using an array here. Area to volume, area to volume S, and area to volume B. Those are arrays, and each uh, thread will write on a different uh, memory location along the array. So that is okay. But this one, those scalar values, those, all those scalar values could pose a problem. And by the way, when you run something like this, this is at least smart enough to realize that E, the I here, and I must be uh, private. There is no other option for that to be private. So this is private, no problem about that. Um, but everything else, OpenMP doesn't know if, if you want, what exactly you want to do. If you want to keep this private or you want to um, make it uh, uh, public or share our, our, our across all of them. So you will see something like that. Uh, very weird. And actually, uh, if you execute it several times, you get actually different numbers. No matter if some of those values will differ. And the reason for that, that, those are the tricky parts of debugging a, a parallel code, is figuring out why something like this is happening. Most likely is something like the uh, race condition where different uh, different threads are writing on places that should not be uh, shared uh, and destroying the, the calculation, basically. So uh, this is what happens. So here I took one of those cases uh, where I actually got different values. So the, the, the code were for writing, I, they some of those use one value and some of the other codes, uh, other cores, uh, over in the meantime, wrote uh, another value and they, they produce at least two different kinds of, of values. So the solution in OpenMP is being aware of that and making some of those variables private. When, when I mean private, it means that before starting the loop, OpenMP will create copies of those. Each thread will have its own copy of cube size, diameter, volume, surface sphere, and they will be independent. Uh, another thing is that they will disappear at the end of the, of the execution, so at the end of the loop, and only one will survive. Uh, uh, if, if that is what we are doing, if we are shrinking the number of cores. Uh, in, in practice, what happens, in, uh, it depends on the, in the, in the implementation of that. Uh, the first time that you uh, open the multi-threading, uh, those threads are preserved until the end of the execution and they can reuse somehow. So, but there is no guarantee that that will, that will be the case. So you can assume that those just disappear. Um, so let's see, let's correct this this problem here. Uh, not this bit. Uh, let's correct ratio. Correct. Um, uh, by introducing the right things that should be private. Okay. By default, everything is public except 
the i here, the, the, the index that is running the loop. So we need cube side to be private. That's obvious. We need diameter, which is a scalar, but it's also dependent on cube to be private because every thread will have a different diameter here. And the surface sphere uh, here should be private because again, it's dependent on the diameter. And I did this on purpose to have multiple things I could have done in just one. But um, area to volume doesn't need to be private. Uh, and actually, actually, we don't want it to be private. We want to have all those values here so we can bring those here uh, nicely. Uh, so this is okay. This is not included there. Volume Q um, is something that we need to be private because it's relying on, on, on this. So it's, it's the volume of the cube and the cube changes with the size of the cube. So that is, that is something. Um, uh, and that's it. So those are the variables. This is a very simple but important element of programming in OpenMP, deciding what is private. Um, so now I uh, will compile this. Same thing, same measures, uh, line 19, OpenMP parallel. Uh, and executing this, how uh, you get the right values. So there's a match between what you get and you expect here. So here, what I've got is the area of volume and the area of volume compute independently. So here I have a serial code uh, for control. It's, it's, it's the same code here. This is my serial code when I know that this is working right. Uh, and this is my parallel code. And now both values, the serial version and the parallel version return the same result. So an important message here is deciding what is, what is um, a, uh, private or, or shared. By the way, there is something here on uh, open and key. Um, so they have nice resources here. Don't worry, it's the, the code, not specific. So if you want, it is just, like a small chip down, say for uh, this is, uh, let's say the reference guide for folks. But you can get something like this. It's uh, four pages. And this is all that you need to know for programming when, with OpenMP. All the different uh, arrangements. We are using a, a parallel and parallel do with. There is a combined version of that. Uh, I think it's around here, the parallel do. We're using this. Uh, OpenMP, parallel do, the clause, the different, the different arguments here, and end parallel. So in four pages, that's all that it, and the, that OpenMP is all about. It. And, and the variables, and, the, uh, and we will see some of those. Uh, so here. So now. Mm, now, so now it's working. So this is, we fix it with this. So, which are the kinds or the attributes that we can pull and impose over variables here? And by default, everything is shared, but we can change the default. So, and that is actually a good exercise to, uh, to do something like this. And so, you can change something like this. So, let's see. Uh, Can delete this. And use something like this. Default none. If you use this, when you compile, it will fail. And it will tell you all the variables for which you have not declared explicitly if they are shared or, or, or private. So that forces you, and that's when you are facing like, like a debugging problem. Uh, that force you to be aware uh, that maybe you are forgetting to make something share, uh, something private. So doing this, make those things uh, conscious uh, to you. Uh, so that's something, and that's the reason when you do something like this, you 
can declare uh, what it will be shared, what it will be you know, will be uh, private. That, that's why the, the share exists. But the, by default, if you're not using something like this, by default, all the variables are shared. You can also declare something private. Uh, and you can also declare that there's a couple of things. First, private. Uh, and in that case, it receives the, uh, the value uh, from outside. And that value is initializing all the work of the trends. So imagine something like this, uh, for example. Uh, so imagine that I have here a value that I'm using for something, let's say Z, uh, something like that. If I need this value here, um, by default, the copies that are created not in general will not have will not have the value that I initialize. So just one thread will have z equal to. Now, if I want to preserve that value z equal to for all of them for all the threads that will be generated, I need to put the first private. Uh, uh, inside here. So first private Z and all of them will get initialized correctly. And that, that's the meaning of this first private. Um, uh, and also same thing, at the end, when they finish the calculation, there is no guarantee of, of those private elements to survive or to be updated at the end for the value that is that that will be preserved so the last private will take for the last uh, element in the iteration the value that will be promoted outside the loop so same thing here if you want if you are doing something with z and you want to finish something here uh, the value outside the loop if if you are not using last private it will be lost and that that's another thing so those are basically the different clauses that you can pose, impose to, for data sharing. And in most cases, this is all that you need to declare something private because you initialize those variables inside the loop. So exactly what we did here. So we don't have to make CubeSide uh, with the uh, first private or something like that, because we are initializing this value here. And same thing for diameter, we are initializing this value. All those values are initialized inside the loop, so they can have whatever garbage was there when, uh, when, when they start. Um, so here, inside the, inside the, 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 the so they, they came with uh, irrelevant values inside, uh, all of them will have received initialization inside the loop. And so that's okay. That's why we are not using first private. Or, and I don't care about those values at the end because all that I need is what's stored in the area here, in the area to volume P. So uh, it's okay. And that is a shared variable, so they are working on the same. Uh, so here I have one example here uh, to clarify that this is actually a nice example. So let's see run the process. Okay, so what I did here, let's let's read this. Just this is just for for making more explicit what what I just told you about the difference between a shared variable, a private variable, because this is the core of, of parallelizing loops in in OpenMP. So it, it's important for this to be clear. Uh, so I'm having a variable here that was declared shared, uh, another was declared private, 
uh, on loss prime. So we have all variety of those, A, B, C, and D, right? And A was declared share, B was declared private, C was declared uh, first private, and D was declared last private. And I am initializing all of them with one. So here inside this loop, I am just printing what, what is the value inside. Like, show me the value. And now I am increasing this. So I am, may, I am changing the values to see what happens at the end. And here's at the end of, of this execution. Uh, so I compile it, I run it. So notice that this um, value was private, but it has some garbage that, that when I print first, uh, so pay attention to this uh, one of the, yeah, here, inside. So this was the value outside of the loop. This was the value outside, it, before the loop, after the loop, what it has. Notice that we, all of them, we initialize with one, so one, 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 one. Inside the loop, this one has some garbage. Now, those other, uh, the other uh, values are were zero. But there is no guarantee on, on, on what, what we have here. That they are, they are gone. And those that are shared, they change. They change, but they don't change consistently. They have one here, and they are increasing on each of them. It's, it's overriding values. If you execute it multiple times, you will get something. Here, this one. Is always one here, always one. And this one has some value here, but at the end uh, has a different value. So this is last private. The only that is survived is the last iteration. The last iteration was not this one, this, this iteration. This one is this uh, case here. And the last iteration will be this one and end up with that. Uh, so that is uh, the difference between those. And, and, and usually you need to declare uh, either some of those private, and if you need uh, something from outside before uh, that has been initialized or have contained some value that is relevant, first private. Last private is less common uh, in general. So now, mm, uh, okay, now uh, this is a, a small comment about uh, nesting loops. Uh, when you have multiple loops, one inside other, what actually this is doing is paralyzing across the outer loop here. Uh, this is always private, but there is no guarantee that J will be private. In Fortran, it is that way but not in C. So in C, you need to explicitly indicate that J will be private. So, but just to be sure, it's a good idea to make J also private explicitly, uh, just to avoid confusion between, uh, between Fortran and C. Uh, and remember that this uh, execution here is doing the right, the, the right order, and I, we talked about that yesterday. We are cycling here in the internal loop. We are cycling with the fast index and the fast index is the internal one. Is this J? The J is the index that is that moves faster. So, so the column is more, more faster. Here. And the slow index is I here. So that, that's why we are cycling out in the outer loop is cycling over I. And that is an important performance issue when you if you mess up with with the ordering of of those loops. It's not that we produce wrong results. It's just that it could be uh, significant this number. Now, reductions. Consider, for example, this is a typical case of that. Um, cases where you uh, what you need is not a particular value. What you need is a reduction or, or, or an operation, a function done on all the values that were computed by all those threads. 
a case, for example, is you are, in this case, we are computing a, a quadrature. Uh, we need to get the addition of all those values. So what exactly is going to Okay, I think I'm computing the Euler number with a factorial here. So I'm, I am keeping the factorial here. Um, so factor is private because I'm, I'm reusing the, I'm not computing factorial over and over. This is stupid. Uh, I am just computing the element of the factorial and the next one is just multiplying for the next number that is entered in the, in the loop. So that's why I'm, I'm keeping this private. And here, uh, this is the reduction. So I am running this in parallel. Uh, multiple threads are computing those. They will have their own copy of Euler. What I need is not, are not those private copies. What I need is what is the sum of all those partial contributions. So this means that when I leave this loop here, I want the master thread, the, the, the thread that survives here, to have a reduction, a sum, a reduction with a sum for all the partial binaries of oil. So some of them will compute this from, let's say, from one to 10 and they will have a partial version of oil. An other thread will compute for 11 to 20, and they will have the value. At the end of the loop, they will combine all those values with the sum, so we'll sum those values, and it will store that in order, so it get the right value at the end. And, uh, let me see this. Oh, yes, I forgot about that. I put the default non purpose here. So, public uh, share, sorry, sorry, share. So Euler is shared here, uh, but is, uh, this is not needed, uh, or maybe, uh, or maybe because I put the default. If, let's say, if I don't put the default here, uh, reduction is always private. The Euler is always private because it's the, the, the variable that is a reduction. So it's obvious that, uh, that, that, that I don't know why this is forcing me. I brought it to the default. Yes. That's it is. It's, a, it's, it's an obvious um, uh, private variable. Uh, so, okay, that is what I'm doing. So I'm creating this loop parallel here, and at the end, I am asking for a reduction. So, so here I execute this, so you see, uh, and I'm getting all the partial values, the partial contributions, and I am getting the final value of this. Uh, with the sum of all those contributions. So, um, by the way, this, for example, most of them are really small. So this one has a big contribution. This one has uh, the biggest one, and this one, and other values are smaller, but at, at some point they, they just need to, have to be added for getting the right final result. Uh, and there are several ways of, 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 of doing those reductions. There are several alternatives to that. Uh, in, this is plus, this is one of them. Uh, but we have a, a star. In that, in that case, and they have, uh, let's say, good values to initialize those things. So if you are doing a multiplication, of course, the first value, the initial value for that private value, for that private will be one. 
There is no sense that they would be initialized in zero. That's stupid. Um, so one, uh, for some and, uh, and subtraction, they are initialized by in zero. Um, you can also compute and so they will be they will execute an and 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 for all the threads. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, another that is used very often is max to get the maximum value or the minimum value. Uh, and there are some others for, for integer uh, volume calculations. But so uh, most of the time you are doing this and for the exercise today, we will be using this reduction for uh, an infinite product. Uh, another thing that we use often is this one. Now, yeah. And each of them, you can assume that they are computing a, a, a dyadic operator, let's say, for the maximum. So they are computing the maximum between two elements. So they go in a cascade. You have 10 elements that will act the best performance of those things. It's, it's not having one central process to deal with that. And just having two threads will, will, will share the value, will uh, converge the value, and after the others, the others uh, in, in pairs. And the, the cascade uh, collapses to a single one. Um, so that, uh, that is another important thing for, for loops reduction. Uh, uh, okay, now let's go for values. Uh, as I told you, if you are computing, imagine that you are computing half uh, a plate or something, a simulation about around the space, and you divide the space, you make a domain decomposition. Uh, so you are computing something uh, in a space. Uh, you don't want this half or this section of the, of the thread being one time beyond the rest of the simulation. Or then at some point need to agree to be on the same time. Uh, and for doing that, we need barriers. We don't want too many barriers. We just need the right amount of barriers. Barriers are things that limit the performance of the execution. We put them there because they are inevitable. But if we can, we should remove all those barriers. There is no sense to have barriers. So this is something important um, for performance. Barrier is one way of preventing uh, race conditions. Another way of preventing race condition is by adding blocks that we declare as critical. It means that only one thread in a single moment can execute that operation. That, for example, you are updating some variable, updating some value that is, that, that is shared. Uh, and we just want one, process, one thread to use that value and update that value. And even if that could take several steps, we just want to preserve that section uh, as something that only one thread can do at a time. Uh, so we will see examples of, of, of all the things uh, with very, very simple examples. Um, here, uh, this is a case, for example, where you want, uh, notice that the first time that we did uh, the printing, uh, there is no order for those things. Uh, the, the printing is completely random. Um, so here, what I'm doing is, uh, let me see if I can show you this. Order F90. So here I'm using the, the library uh, and I'm printing uh, here this message. And I want to ensure that uh, each thread prints in the right order. So only the first thread will print if uh, the third print, the third thread will print only if the previous two threads are printing their own their own thing first. So it will go in order, uh, and this barrier will ensure that here. So we will see this how this works, and we will go back and discuss. And G four what M V four thread is important uh, okay. same thing so it will tell you number line number nine uh, parallel 
line number six, 16, there is a bar. Um, we execute this. And notice that now all those threads are in order. Uh, let's see, let's review what we did here. Let's see, let's actually remove the bar. So you see what, what is going on here. So if we are not doing this, what happens? Uh, no barrier. We execute those threads brain when they arrive to that moment of not, picking, uh, not a specific order. Uh, so now that's the reason why we are doing this. We are controlling the number of threads here. We are getting this with this function here. We are getting the number of threads that, that we have. And we are waiting until the right thread uh, or reaches this point and print. If, there, if this has been the case for, for one, it will go for the next one, for the next uh, thread ID, and will print the message. And all of them will print when the term arrives to them uh, for printing. So that is, let's say, a very simplified way of showing uh, the use of this. Uh, in general, this is something that you use when you are doing domain decomposition, but for doing that, the codes become uh, much larger, so it's harder to read. Uh, but just for you to know that uh, this is something that is important uh, to know. And, uh, and, the, and the, uh, another alternative here is this case, for example. Uh, let see, I probably have it right here. Uh, where is that? Uh, it's, maybe, it's maybe this one. Exercise. Yes, it's this one. So, here I have a, a, a parallel section here, from here to here. And I have this private and this product private. I am doing a product. So, but I'm not, I'm not actually using a reduction in this case. Something that I could have done, but I'm doing it in a different way. Each uh, thread will have its own copy of partial product. I am computing the a product here. I think this is uh, seeing uh, the signals of uh, pi z divided by I see. Um, that, that's what I'm computing here. Um, so this loop here is parallelized. This is, by the way, this is another way of separating the parallel section from the, the loop that being parallelized. So the, this, the parallel section goes from here to here. I am running the loop here. And at the end, the different threads will have their own copy of partial prompt. If I do this without a, a critical block here and cycling dot in critical, all those threads will write on their own time and write and overwrite uh, the value of total prompt. And, I, and at the end, I will not get the right one because one will take the value, another will take the value, will print the value, another will not realize that the value have changed or will print over again. And the, the critical will prevent that. It's kind of an implicit barrier uh, because it will, all the other threads will be uh, uh, in the waiting line until the, the system is free for, for them to enter uh, an execution. So this is how you compile this thing. Uh, but we can do this. Uh, yeah, exercise three, ninety. So now we have here a parallel, here a barrier, here a critical section here, and the end of critical section. Mm, let's see. Here, there is an implicit barrier. At the end of a loop, there is an implicit barrier, barrier always. That's why the, 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 
the media compiler stability. There is an even if you don't see an a barrier here, it will not be to the next uh, to the next section of the code until all that loop here has been exhausted, has been completed. So there is an implicit barrier here. Uh, but after this point, we got all those threads having their own partial product, and now now we need a critical section for preventing of uh, damage in the, the final one. So again, I complete that, and I am getting the right value. That that's uh, again is it's what is doing. Uh, so it's okay. Z is zero point is one over four. So it's sinus of pi over four, and you can you can search uh, for the value is sinus of pi over four divided by pi over four. Um, uh, that's the right one. Anyway, uh, so that is another way of imposing barriers and synchronization elements uh, in the execution. Uh, and there is, let me see if there is more. Uh, okay, there is a final example that I would like to show you here is that beyond loops, another thing that you can do uh, with OpenMP is multitasking. So th that is the most general way of, of execution that you can imagine. Uh, in this case, you are asking different threads to do completely different things. Uh, in particular, I have here uh, a module, a Fortran module that contains the subroutine that is computing uh, the of primes. Uh, here, another subroutine that is computing some sinus functions. And here I have another subroutine. So I have three subroutines inside this module. Um, and here is the main, main, my, main, main problem, my main problem here. Um, and I'm here and creating a parallel section that goes from here to here. In this parallel block here, I have three sections. This one, this one, and this one. Those three sections will execute in parallel and they do completely different things. And actually, they do uh, this one, for example, will run those elements uh, uh, 20,000, and this one will run for 40,000. So they also run for a different amount of time. Uh, it's the most general thing that you, uh, that you can do with this. Uh, so let's see what we can do uh, with this example. I think I have it here. Uh, tables, tables, not here. Oh, no, task. I think it's yes. Uh, yes, this is the code that I put there. So yeah, I have three sections here, three sections. They compute their own thing independently. Uh, and they finish. So I will compile this. Uh, So we have here a parallel, and inside this parallel, I have a sections here, three sections, and n sections, and an implicit bar. There also there is an implicit barrier here, uh, right here. Uh, in, in the case that we have something here and we are doing something here, there is a barrier here at the end, and in n sections. And there are ways to prevent that of being a barrier. You can ask. The first one who finish go go and continue doing something else. Uh, there are way to put a no weight on those barriers uh, and move on. Uh, but that's not what I'm doing here. Uh, so that's what we have. The barrier. Uh, we run this. It will take a while. Each section. It will compute the primes. One section will compute the primes, another one the sinus, another one the cosinus. And, and I am actually getting some timing. So the cosinus, I think, will take double of the time because it's much larger. 
So you see here, uh, this one, this one, and this one was taking a lot of time, or at least much larger because it was computing 40,000 40, elements instead of just 20,000. So that's another thing that uh, you know, we compute. Uh, I This is a good thing. I, I usually put an stop. Notice that the code, if you see here uh, in Fortran, if you put an stop here, uh, the Fortran 2003 or 2008, I'm not really sure which which version, uh, will mandate that if there is any possible accuracy with uh, by doing the operations that is not conforming to the uh, with some IEEE standard. It should pop up. It should send a message there at the end. So, and I probably that's the case with those signals and cosigners that are not compliant. The, 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 the answer could be in a sign. Uh, if you really, really go into the details, and you can compile, uh, compilers could be forced to to comply to the to the standards so you get. You get a different result. Uh, but that's it. Really. That's a warning that is not a big deal. The important thing here is that we are doing a multi task operation uh, and three different tasks run uh, simultaneously on this. So uh, that concludes this introduction to OpenMP. And I have now the exercises. The exercises are really simple. You can finish those in uh, at least those two are relatively simple. This one, uh, uh, let me see. Uh, uh, the, the three are relatively simple. Yeah, yeah, you, you, you can write those, in. Uh, and we have basically one hour for that. Uh, so the first one is going into sequence. So you write this, uh, it's basically following the, 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 uh, the prescription, the write one message. Now convert that into a parallel. I have a, I, I have a typo here. Sorry, it's parallel double out in the wrong place. Um, and now you convert that into a multi-thread. You run it. You will see the, the message. Um, and now inserting this for printing the thread number and this and compiling it. So that exercise is basically what a very 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 small code following. Uh, uh, adding the elements one by one for getting your first parallel code up and running. Um, yeah, and one challenge here is to put this into a private, uh, into a variable and check what happens when you put the parallel without saying that those are uh, uh, private. So yeah, what, what is the message that we get and what is the difference? So now this one is, is the generalization of the code that, that I always show you for Pi that uh, makes the quadrature. It, it's just making the quadrature for a function that is different, basically. Um, so write the code uh, on, on your own for, for, this, for this function. Make the sounds uh, and put the variables uh, in place. Basically replicate that with a different. A challenge could be to change this rectangle approach and improve, well, it's not actually improvement, it doesn't improve too much, but uh, in some cases it's cool, is instead of making rectangles, you make trapezoids. So it will be the average between the right and left side. Uh, you can see the, the, uh, the trapezoid quadrature. It, it, it's a very standard numerical procedure for integration, for numerical integration. And so that's it. So the same thing, there's a variation of that. So this one is um, a, a product that converges into pi over two. So do this uh, using a reduction for the product uh, to get the right one, to, uh, to parallelize this with OpenMP and get the value uh, and answer how many terms you, you actually need to get four good decimals uh, for the value of pi. So you can search which is the value of pi divided by two and, and see you know, how many elements do you need for this. Uh, 
this is a well-known uh, infinite product that converts why it's not the most efficient it's not something that you would use for anything serious but it's a good exercise for for the conversion of, of with products so please if you want to take your time uh, pick one of those exercises uh, and explore and familiarize yourself with with the execution of with python but, uh, with uh, fortran and open API. okay and if you have questions just pose a question and i will try to help you uh doing the hour. okay thank you very much uh, uh, i will be around during the next hour